Um, okay, so my name's Eric Kaufman. I, I know some of you from last year. Uh, I'm the managing partner at VE Capital in New York. Um, our focus is uh, energy infrastructure and MLP investing. Uh, we're very pleased that uh, our senior analyst, Ron Barone, could be here today to talk with you about uh, MLPs, energy, anything else you guys would like to ask. Um, Ron has 44 years of experience in dealing with just this precise area, and uh, he'll tell you a little bit more about his background uh, as he gets going. Ron? Okay. Thank you, Eric. Um, good morning, and thank you for getting up and coming here. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it was pretty hard going to bed early last night. But, um, uh, yeah, I have been following this space um, for roughly 51 years, I hate to tell you. Uh, I, was first, I started my career four years on the buy side, and I was buying debt uh, for energy companies and helped finance all the pipelines um, that were being built at that point in time, uh, actually working on the the debentures, the uh, indentures, and everything else. After those four years, I went to the sell side, so I was on Wall Street, and I was uh, worked for uh, Kidder Peabody, Payne Weber, and UBS as managing director there. So I was 44 years, and then now three years with Eric, so roughly 51 years. I say that to put in perspective this next statement. I think right now is one of the most attractive times to get into the MLP space that I have seen in my 51 year career. And if anybody wants to know, you know, or wants to ask, is your money where your mouth is? Yes, it is definitely. I mean, I, I am loaded up with them. And um, so far, so good. My timing, I think, was pretty impeccable. I jumped in uh, about a month ago, six weeks ago, big time. I mean, I always had them, but I sold a whole bunch of debt and loaded into them. And I think a lot has changed over the last 18 months that's really got me excited. And um, let me just see if uh, I can do this. Yeah, okay, cool. I mean, what's changed? And we're gonna go through this, and obviously we got some Q&A at the end. And Eric and I are around all day, and we're gonna have a breakout and so forth. Um, the things that have changed in the last 18 months are, number one, there's been regulatory rollbacks, and I, I will talk about that in a second. Number two, approvals of major pipelines, DAPL, DAPL, um, that's the Dakota Access Pipeline. Uh, Keystone, uh, Rover, these are big pipelines. Number three, you've had OPEC production cuts. Number four, the Tax Reform Act. Uh, all, all of those four things are very positive for the MLP space. Number five, FERC, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, came out with a rate order, and um, that was a negative, no doubt about it. But the interesting thing is, the market took it as a major negative, they all sold off, and it affects only a handful of MLPs, less than 10, that I think are gonna be dramatically affected. So, um, Let's go on to the next slide and talk about some of those points. Regulatory relief, okay? In Obama's, the Obama administration's eight years, he put into effect 3,000 regulations. The cost of that was $8,872 billion. Of the 3,000, 439 directly affected the energy industry. Paperwork compliance time, 48 million hours. Total cost, $548 billion. And roughly 63% of this was absorbed by the energy industry. Um, major uh, roadblocks, stumbles, couldn't get anything done. Well, what's happened uh, over the last 18 months? Well, we got a new president, we have a new administration. And uh, he is, and his administration are expediting environmental reviews and approvals. The president himself put out a memorandum uh, on Keystone uh, XL urging the approval of that pipeline. You know, urgent for them to get the regulatory approvals to um, get going. Um, the Dakota Access Pipeline, which had been stopped numerous times underneath the Obama administration, numerous times during the construction phase, stopped because of court appeals. Um, that is in 
operating now. <laughs> I mean, that was the, one of the first things Trump did, get to Dakota, Dakota Access. That's operating now. That is a major pipeline, and we'll talk about that as we go through. FERC, again, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission um, approvals. Rova pipeline, big pipeline. I'll show you that in a minute. Um, the, they're actually starting up. They're in phase one. Atlantic Sunrise, Mountain Valley, Atlantic Coast Pipelines, all of these approved in 2017. You couldn't get these approved before. And, it got, and the fact is, when you have these huge delays in building pipelines, it increases the cost of building the pipeline, and it makes projects not economical. So we've seen a lot done. This is an administration that's friendly for businesses trying to get rid of some of those roadblocks. <clears throat> this, uh, uh, <coughs> excuse me, map shows the uh, some of those FERC certificates, and as you can see, the uh, um, you know the the yellow line the was the part of it's the Atlantic Sunrise Pipeline. This is all part of the Transco system, which is a critical system. Transco brings gas from it really originates in the Gulf of Mexico onto Texas, Louisiana, all the way up the Atlantic coast. Supplies about 50 percent of the gas in New York City and uh, is probably one of the major supplies up into the New England market. And we desperately need gas in New England, okay? New England is, uh, natural gas has got a very small market share in New England, smallest of any place else in the United States. And um, it's, it's a pretty good market for heating you know, in the wintertime. So this is, this is all certificated last year. So again, things are changing. Um, this map basically wanted to show you that these large projects create value. This is the Rova pipeline. You can see it starts at the tail end of Pennsylvania, goes right through Ohio, and then, you know, up into Michigan. It's not only this pipeline but that was important, but once this pipeline's built, there's additional add-on opportunities for mass limited partnerships, or MLPs, and there's great things for the economy. Um, you're going to need laterals once this pipeline's built. And the laterals, for instance, and, and this pipeline runs through the Utica, which is a major producing basin, the laterals take the gas from the well and ship it to a processing plant where they strip out liquids because you can't burn a lot of the gas just like that. You've got to strip out the liquids. It's too rich. And then the lateral continues and takes that gas to a pipeline, and the pipeline will take that uh, a distance. And then there'll be another lateral, which will take that gas from that pipeline to a gas distribution company that serves the community, to an electric utility that needs it for boiler fuel, an industrial customer. So, you know, you get this pipeline being built, and you, you have the laterals, you have the gas processing plants. Once you pull out the liquids out of the gas, you have to fractionate it, separate them. So there's a lot of add-ons that get created with each pipeline that's being built and it's tremendous for the economy the jobs you know number one to build the laterals number two to you know um, uh, service them um, the security to operate the uh, liquids plants I mean this is really very very positive and we're very grateful the Trump administration realizes this um, let's talk a bit about oil prices. We said OPEC, uh, <clears throat> you know, had production cuts, and um, we clearly think they're going to extend them. And basically, the surplus is gone. And before we get into this, I wanted to say one thing, which is not really in the slide. I do not get tied up in the week-to-week -week inventory numbers. You know, one week you get, oh, oil inventories are up two, uh, two, two million barrels this week, and oil prices slide. Next week you get... Oh, they're down to 2 million barrels and the prices come back. We're investors. We're not oil traders. So I really look at the long-term trend. What's happening? What's going to go on? And there's a couple of things that I see. If we look at the situation right now, the world today is using 100 million barrels of oil every day. Worldwide, each year, we lose 5 million barrels of oil. This is due to the decline in the fields. This is a normal decline in production, the decline curve. It's in natural gas fields, it's in oil fields, it's in any mineral that you're producing, there's gonna be a decline curve. And the decline curve happens to be 5%. So each year you're losing 5 million, uh, each day, you know, each year we're losing 5 million barrels of production. 
At the same time, the demand for oil is growing. It's growing by about one and a half million barrels a day. So we must replace about six and a half million barrels per day each year. Let's fast forward this and take this five years down the road. Well, five times six and a half, we're going to get 32 and a half million barrels. So over the next five years, we're going to have to replace 32 and a half million barrels of production. Let's put that in perspective. OPEC today produces roughly 32 and a half million barrels. We're going to have to find a new OPEC in five years. So to me, that says this is a very important trend. You know, and you know, if anybody wants to, you know, raise the question, oh, what about, you know, Tesla? You know, we've got all these electric cars. Like, okay, you're going to need electricity to run that car. And somewhere, oil or natural gas is going to be burned in a boiler to generate the electricity that's eventually going to end up in that car. You're just moving where the energy is going to be burned. So with these electric cars, you're still going to have to generate electricity somewhere. So... I think, you know, the trend definitely looks upward. But there's one more other big thing, and that's the Aramco initial public offering. The Kingdom of Saudi Arabia has made known that next year it wants to sell about a 5% interest in its 100% holding of the Arabian American uh, oil company, Aramco. This is going to be one of the largest uh, IPOs in history uh, of the financial markets. It is very important for them to get a high valuation. Low oil prices are not going to help them. And um, it's our view, um, the Saudis are going to do everything possible to get the price of oil up. And it's not on the slide, but it just was announced, I think, yesterday. Saudi Arabia's oil production in April was 9.868 million barrels a day the lowest since January of 2017. So they're cutting back on that production to get that oil price up. So I think the trend is upward. Now, you know, the reason why I wanted to talk about oil prices is um, basically that was probably responsible for a big part of the decline in MLP stocks starting in September of 2014. And I don't think there's tied to oil prices. Uh, There's a lot of MLPs that have nothing to do with oil, uh, but the bottom line is psychologically it did impact them, and I just wanted to bring that up. And psychologically, I think it does impact the market. So let's go on to talk about the tax laws, okay? We just got a new tax bill passed by, again, the administration and pushed by. Um, they have kept the pass-through status uh, for MLPs. The 20% income deduction for MLPs uh, has been kept. And basically, if you own MLPs and you get $100,000 of income, and you're only going to pay taxes on $80,000 of income. You can exclude 20%. Um, this also applies to the recapture of previously deferred incomes. You know, portion, portions of their distributions or dividends are tax deferred. And uh, the 20% uh, income deduction uh, exempted MLPs from any W-2 wage limitations. I mean, the bottom line, if you look at the bottom of that chart and you go over to the right-hand side, total effective rate to MLP investors, prior law 39.6, new tax act 29.6. Very positive. Okay. Remember I said um, there was one development over the last 18 months that was negative. It was the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Well, I happen to know it was uh, March 15th. I was boarding a plane to go from Orange County. I live in California, in Orange County, to Dallas. And um, my iPhone started going crazy with beeps, literally. I mean, these are alerts coming over. And, like, this MLP is down 5%, and this is down 6%. And it was just like... Unbelievable. I got on the phone and called Eric. What happened? <laughs> well, it seems the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission came out and ruled that MLPs can no longer use an income tax allowance in their rate calculations, and they proposed an adjustment. And all of the group sold off big time. What has, does FERC have to do with MLPs? FERC, or Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, regulates the inter 
state movement of natural gas, not intra-state movement, only inter. FERC has nothing to do with a lot of MLPs. And MLP out there, it makes wood pulps, you know, for ch these ships to be burned for electric utility, for fuel. FERC's got nothing to do with them. E everyone sold off. And, you know, the bottom line is if you look at the interstate movement of natural gas, that could be regulated by FERC. There's two types. Interstate gas, a pipeline has a contract. Um, that contract could be regulated by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Uh, it's cost of service gas. Or it could be negotiated where the pipeline negotiates with the end user, which is normally a big industrial customer, or a gas distribution company or an electric utility. It's somebody big. It's not us in our homes. Those are negotiated contracts, and the FERC does not regulate negotiated contracts. So let's put this in perspective. It only affects companies that move gas in the interstate market. It only affects their, their cost of service contracts. It does not affect their negotiated contracts. Many of the companies that are going to be affected have publicly come out with statements the impact will be de minimis is the word that they have used. This is very insignificant. The group sold off. Great opportunity. So they're going to do something. It, it, the gas industry obviously has appealed this. Um, this is going to go to the courts. This is not going to go through for a long time. So and they're, they're going to probably take a look at what happens with the oil companies, oil pipelines in 2020. Um, but again, um, a lot of those are negotiated contracts. Ferkel has no control. So the market clearly has given us a buying opportunity. This slide shows you March 15th. <laughs> As you can see, I think they gapped down that day in that little red circle. Uh, pretty ugly day. They have come a bit of a ways back. Um, in perspective here, let's take a look at what has happened with the group since the turn of the century. From, um, you know, January 1, 2000 to last Friday, if you look at the column all the way over on the right-hand side, you can look at the other columns, but the right-hand side is, in my opinion, what we wanted to really show you here, the real key column, the annualized total return. The AMZ is an index of mass limited partnerships, okay, the very first one. Annualized average total return over that period, 11.6%. And then next one, S&P uh, 500, annualized total return, 5.4. Uh, the Dow, annual total return, 6.8. This has been a good group. And we often refer to this as mailbox money. You know, I went online yesterday before the market opened up and checked my account. Oh, I was up $8,000. Oh, some dividend checks came in. I mean... I got nothing wrong with mailbox money. It's, it's fine to me. So here's our yield comparison as of today. Or again, this is last Friday, but I'm sure it hasn't changed that much. The AMZ, the average yield, and the MLP index up 8.1 uh, is 8.1%. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, 8%. Um, the REITs, 4.6. Utilities, 3.7. Ten-year Treasury, 3.1. And um, the S&P, 1.9. Um, on top of that 8% yield, we think you're going to grow pretty nice distribution growth. I'll talk about that in a second. This is a graph showing the, the AMZ performance. And as you can see, it hit a high of 540 in um, the fall of 2014, and then oil prices crashed. And I got down to a low of uh, 199, and that was, I believe, February 16th, uh, February 2016. And we've seen a bit of a recovery back. We're right now about 259. Um, we think we're still going to go back quite a bit more, and I'll mention that in a minute. But let me just talk about the fundamental outlook for this group, okay? I don't know how we're doing on time. Oh, we're good. I'm sorry? I'm sorry? Give us an extra 10 minutes, Ronnie, because of the AV. Don't 
Oh, okay. okay. Oh, they'll give us. Sorry. We're good. Okay. All right. MLP assets. I just want to make the point they are absolutely critical to the functioning of the economy. Okay? If we didn't have those pipelines and those laterals and those processing plants, we would not be able to move gas from the Gulf, from onshore Texas, Louisiana, to any market in the United States. We wouldn't have natural gas to heat, to cook, to hot water, to burn, to burn for fuel for electric utility. We wouldn't have natural gas liquids, which we strip out of the natural gas stream. We wouldn't have any plastic. That's what natural gas liquids come from, plastic. Natural gas liquids are used in everything. Natural gasoline, one of the liquids, is used in gasoline for cars. Um, it, you wouldn't have a lot of the liquids going to aviation fuel, okay? Um, if you didn't have pipelines for oil, you, you wouldn't have, you know, uh, everything that goes with it, gasoline, aviation fuel, everything that runs the economy. These are absolutely critical. We cannot live without them, period, okay? And... Um, the energy, the demand for energy in the United States is booming because the economy is booming and globally it's booming. I mean, think about it. Right now, for the first time in many, many years, okay, we are able to export oil. We're exporting natural gas liquids. Um, we're exporting natural gas. That's going to Mexico. We're exporting it in liquefied natural gas form overseas. Um, Go back three, four years. We weren't exporting anything, okay? Maybe a dribble of gas to Mexico then. Now it's big time exports to Mexico. So the demand for energy is very strong. The economy is strong, and volumes are strong. Most mass limited partnerships are what we call toll takers. The way they make their money is how much gas goes through that pipeline. They don't care what the price of gas is. They don't buy it. They don't resell it, okay? They guess they're like a taxi. They get, they charge for moving it, and the more volumes, the more money they're going to make. Same thing with oil. They get paid per barrel of oil that flows through that line. They don't care if oil prices are $50 a barrel or $100 a barrel. So strong economy, volumes up. This is going to be good for them. High current yield, I showed you the yield a minute ago was about 8% on the space right now. We estimate going forward the dividend growth will be at least 4%, possibly higher, but 4% would be my minimum. Now, there's wide ranges depending on the MLPs. Some of them are going to have 0% dividend growth, and some are going to have double digit uh, 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 dividend growth, distribution growth. So, but that's a pretty nice yield to start off with and get some. Um, growth. Uh, most of the space is self-funding for the first time. The old model of MLPs, when they were first really getting going in the 80s and 90s, is we'll pay out all distributable cash flow, we won't keep anything, we'll just go to the capital markets. Well, that changed over the last year or two, okay? We've already seen them reduce their payout. They didn't, re cut, a lot of them didn't cut the dividend, they just slowed down the growth rate or didn't pay it, didn't increase it but they're generating more internally. There will be less external finance, a lot less. In fact, probably the smallest amount of external finance in the history of, this, of the industry. Um, we've got favorable tax treatment, and keep in mind that these are um, cash, these are tax advantage investment vehicles. And, and uh, if the MLP index, that AMZ that I show you, were to recover to the midpoint over the three years. Remember I said we're at 259 now, and the top was um, 540? If we can only get halfway between those two over the next three years, the average total return is 22.3%. And uh, I wanted to go back. There was one point I wanted to make when talking about the economy, which just hit me in the head, like um, petrochemical industry has been in the midst of a massive expansion. Over the next year, we got about $100 billion of new petrochemical plants coming online. $100 billion, Texas and Louisiana, even one up in Pennsylvania. Um, natural gas, uh, petrochemical plants, their feedstocks, natural gas liquids. So this is, this is gonna be a booming industry. This is a great space. As I say, I personally, 
significantly increased my amount of money invested in them. And I, I've never been as bullish as before. And uh, that's why I think possibly this may be the best fundamental outlook that I've seen. And again, I'm following this energy industry for over 50 years. With that, um, I'm pretty much done on my remarks. And if anybody has some questions, just please speak loud because I got tinnitus, which is ringing into my ears, and <laughs> it's non curable. So when somebody takes up, you're in trouble. I'm sorry? It's ringing in the ears. It's when somebody else picks up, you're in trouble. Oh. <laughs> Well, I think we're a long way on Keystone. In fact, despite the fact that, you know, the Trump administration has been pushing for that, and they've got a lot of hurdles to get over before they get built, and I'm not so sure they're going to get built. And I, I think Canada's got some issues up there. You know, um, the pipeline Kinder Morgan was trying to build to move more oil from Alberta through British Columbia and export. That pipeline's Kinder stopped construction because you know, environmental issues that they mean, they don't want to build it and then not be able to use it. So Kindred literally stopped construction. They're going to decide, I think, the end of, the end of this month, Eric? May? At the end of this month. Yeah, as to whether to go ahead. Uh, Alberta and British Columbia are basically uh, like two six-year-old kids. Um, basically, Alberta told British Columbia, if you don't give us the right to go ahead and build that pipeline through, we're going to cut you off tomorrow. And that, that's where they stand right now. So. And Canada's got a lot of issues up there, and you've got part of the problem is you've got five very independent provinces, and each premier thinks he's the head of the world. So I'm not so sure Keystone's going to be built. What's your favorite NLD? Mm, I don't know. You don't, have to, you don't have to talk about it. You don't have to get yourself in trouble. <laughs> what is your favorite NLD? I think Eric's going to shoot me if I come out with a name. We, we take questions like specific names offline or at our breakout. Yes. So the 20%, is that when you sell an MLB, in general part of the, of the game is ordinary income, does it the 20% apply to that? Yes. Wait, I'm coming down there. <laughs> Hold on. I'll be right down there. Oh, 
I wouldn't have felt it. After five or ten years, I wouldn't have filled it up anymore. Is there a chance of oversupply? Yeah. Oversupply? Some of this cracking in the Marcellus fields are outrageous. Are we going to have an oversupply of gas? I think we're there. Yeah. But that's okay. It's okay. It's not going to affect you. You talked about Saudi Arabia and wanting to keep on public price. Um, could you talk a little bit about Russia? Because I think they want the same thing. Are they are just as much of a effect as Saudi Arabia? Yeah, I, I think, um, I mean, Russia uh, has virtually every member of OPEC um, has huge deficit. I think Russia needs $120 a barrel to balance their budget. The UAE is the only company in OPEC, I think they can balance their budget at about $40, $45 a barrel. Everything else is way up there. Venezuela would be something like 250 Oh, by the way, you know, we didn't mention that. What's left of Venezuela's production is probably going to continue to down. Okay? And when you see this election coming up. You get it? I think we don't want to win. You mean you don't want to buy a square? Yeah, I, I, I think we know who's going to win that election. <laughs> uh, but, but yeah, Russia and uh, supposedly the Gulf Peninsula will be taking up the money. And I don't know what's talking about the sentence of that. I'm sure it's going to be the same. Certainly, at least it's going to be the same kind of bond that's coming out. One of the speakers yesterday said that storage in LPs are virtually dead and going to get worse because of backwardation. Yes, the fact we're a nation might not be there forever, but uh, what is your feeling is about uh, the storage really going down? Or? Yeah, go ahead. Eric and I follow MLP between the two of them. And the year, if you want to say, yeah. about three or four of them. But there's some types of businesses that we don't. For instance, we hate. It's a little like a fruit stand if you're a thrifty fruit buyer. 
if you want to, if you come there trying to buy oranges, but they're not on sale, maybe maybe you're going to settle for bananas. Sooner or later, you'll own all the fruit, but you don't own it on the same day. So it's so when 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 you have people like Ronnie, myself, our partner Victoria, with 90 years of experience, that's what you that's that's why you use us. That's why you use uh, a management company to do this stuff because it is not a good do-it-yourself at home sport. Um, and and your point about storage. Some crude oil storage is very, very necessary for, for what we call blending. Because refineries spec what they want to buy. They'll say it has to be this percentage of sulfur, we've got to have this API gravity, we've got to have this, 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 and this. A lot of what Cushing, Oklahoma is, is blending. So it can send that slug of whatever it is that, the, that that refinery wants off to that refinery. This is a this is a deceptively simple industry that people think is just not a problem to invest in. And every once in a while you get, you know, you, you, the ship's going along just fine in the sea line. So. Yeah, I'm from the I grew up there. I assume you're talking about natural gas storage. No, I was so, just speaking of, I mean. That, no, oil storage is fine. Offshore oil, oil is fine. Yeah. storage is yeah. getting crucified right now. Of course, part of that's Venezuela and. Yeah, some reason I have this going in mind. I mean, you, you know, look, you, you, there are a lot of things that are happening. You've got. For instance, Keystone, if it were built, would allow us to stop buying Venezuelan heavy and Mexican Mayan crude, which is horrible crude. It's a little like liquid asphalt, and if you if you put it in the fridge for 20 minutes, it won't even move in the jar, right? So, so the, the Canadian stuff we use for, we would use for blending. We have to dilute it before it goes in a pipeline or into a tank car with what we call a condensate which comes off of natural gas stuff. And if that dilutes it, then when it gets down to, the, to where it's gonna be blended, they take, they, they extract the condensate and they take it back up and reuse it again to dilute. It's, it, it, it's a complicated business, but, but the storage side, there's a part that's always needed. So for places like New York Harbor, you've gotta have storage. Um, do you remember a couple of years ago, anybody, the uh, pipeline that was the jet fuel pipeline that had that big explosion. I think the Carolinas, remember that? Huge explosion, a guy with a bulldozer ran over something. I killed him, it was really nasty. That pipeline supplies Kennedy and LaGuardia Airport in New York and Newark Airport with jet fuel. It was gonna get pretty bad pretty quickly if they hadn't gotten it fixed. So this is a, do we need new infrastructure? Yes, do we need more of it? Yes. Um, is, is a robust economy helpful? Yes. But what we're interested in are volumes, and we're interested in contracts that yeah. secure those volumes in the stuff that we own. And that's, that's what we call a deep dive into the, into the business. Okay. So, my negative comments on here is just not the best. I mean, salt dumps have been dead for a while. Um, Tell you why we don't do it, and, and it, it's not to be nasty or mean or anything. say, "Oh, you got to hire us to get." You know, you, you, if you want to buy a square, come right over. It's because for for years we would periodically throttle you to somebody that was interested or whatever. The, the problem is that makes us responsible for you. So let's say that next week Ron and Victoria and I are on the phone and we're talking about a particular name, and we don't like something that we just got to be in that big conference, which happens to be next week, right? Now, or or something. And then we make a shift. I don't know how to get a hold of you to tell you that we don't like that name. And so then we're responsible. And so I don't mind being responsible, and neither is Ron, neither is Victoria, for stuff we're managing because all of our stuff is discretionary and separately managed. So I can pull a spreadsheet in five minutes and say, okay, 28,650 shares, get rid of them to my institutional guy and we can set limits and do things, and all of a sudden, if we have a problem with the name, it's gone. Um, that's why we don't do names. And it, it's, it's not prejudicial at all. It's just because it's more to protect people that want the name than it is anything else. Well, the major MLPs are most of them take or pay, large percentage of their through. Major MLPs, is the majority of their throughput take or pay. Um, 
That's a significant force multiplier. There's a thing called minimum volume commitment, and I think that people need to understand what that means. So when you when you're a shipper, a producer shipper, when you need to get gas out of the Permian Basin, you're going to contract with planes on the cactus popcorn. Let's just say I'm just throwing some there. You're going to contract with them for a minimum volume commitment of that pipeline. So, so, so you might say, well, look, uh, we need 20% volume. And we're gonna, we're gonna do that, and we're gonna give you that commitment, which means that if we don't ship that 20%, we st we're still, you know, we still owe the money, okay? But we can also sell that excess in a secondary market. So if we're gonna ship 18%, we can go over here to another producer and say, you want the 2% we didn't ship. So it, it, it doesn't, where it comes into focus is where you have a, 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 an intrastate uh, non-MVC pipeline, and all of a sudden you've got a shipper that has all these commitments over here to other pipelines for minimum volume. Where do you think they're gonna take volume from to meet the commitment? So in other words, that's something that we do, but, but yeah, most of the shippers now are, uh, are noticing they have to do with MVCs. Which is a good point because I mean, you really uh, reduce or eliminate those pipelines. You go ahead and build barrels or pipelines in the West that have enough companies at some point than the contractors or the percentage. I mean, that's what you have to cover the fixed costs. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Talk out the hall if you if you like, guys. Great question.